I know, I know. This is the first panel, and this is a cultivation for patients and caregivers, okay? And, uh, but we have a very special guest. Uh, I don't know if I was the only person when I was walking around before who saw legendary WBZ sports anchor Bob Lobel walking around. Can we get a round of applause? So I also want to I want to thank Mike Can who uh, put this all together. And Mike came up to me and he said, he said, Bob, Bob Lobel is here, and I think we should get him on the stage. And I said only if he wants to, and Mike said he definitely wants to. So we're really lucky here, um, and we're going to start this off with a conversation with Bob, and uh, he's, he's nice enough to share his experience in trying to uh, get me uh, medicinal cannabis, and then we're going to talk to some experts who uh, can help ex teach him, other people here, and me, because I'm trying to get some help from my own grandmother, actually, how to actually go about that. What do you think? Good? All right, so Bob, I just want to thank you for being here, and uh, can you, you know, I think a lot of us know your history in broadcasting, uh, a lot of it. Can you tell us, I guess, in the, sh the short of uh, what brought you here and uh, how long you've had pain and, and what you're really here to address? Well, besides, can you hear right? Can you hear? Up, up. Uh, certainly curiosity brought me here, but i got to tell you the truth. It would be the last place I ever thought I'd be would be a giving the keynote speech at a cannabis convention. I mean, think about it. When I walked in here, and, and I'm here with a friend, we, we decided I just want to check it out, find out what, what's going on, and how close we are to finding uh, places to distribute the prescriptions that I have had written. I had a prescription written by my primary care doctor in Needham for for cannabis. She knows that she had to send it to Oregon. My daughter lives in Oregon. She sent me all the paperwork uh, as to what she had to do. Filled out the paperwork, wrote him a check for $250, sent the doctor's prescription, which said, you show some compassion, you know, and they said, well, I'm sorry, but you have to, as a physician, you have to be registered in Oregon. We can't process this. So they sent it back without the check, by the way. So at any rate, it, it was frustrating. You know, I've told people have told me, well, why don't you drive across the border? Why don't you go up to Maine? Why don't you go to Rhode Island? But you know, I don't want to have to sneak around and I want to do it so I can do it. I just don't want to have a one-shot deal. I know this. I know how much it helps me. I've been on these crutches for like five years. That's when I started. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to give them up. I know that. I know that's that's my life from here on out, and I have to adjust. But the thing that's, I think, for anybody, the worst possible thing for anybody is pain. That is the great leveler, the great equalizer. Pain is a problem. Uh, I spent a lot of time in a pain clinic at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of inventions have happened, like pumps that they put under your skin that pump into your spinal cord to take the edge off the pain. I can only tell you this. I don't know what was in the cartridge that my daughter sent me from Oregon. However, she was uh, she was specific to say, don't worry about it. You can drive after you do it. It's not going to have that effect. It's a pain issue. It's the stuff nobody wants. And it's the throwaway stuff. And she said, you know what? It just works. It just works. There are times at the bottom of my feet I can't walk. I take it before I go to bed. Bingo. Not a problem. It just, it just does the job. So I think that, in closing, thank you for listening to the keynote speech for the Cannabis Convention. That is, uh, that's the reason I was here. Hey, if I could get that from my daughter in Oregon, I surely could find something close to home. Can I, can I just ask... Uh I don't want you to blow the whistle on her about the mail, okay? Just leave her out of this. I'll take the responsibility. Bob, can I, can I ask you, so you were fortunate enough, to, uh, uh, finally, to have a physician who was willing to prescribe. First um, time I walked in, she's, you know, she's cool, she knew. She also didn't think I'd be able to get it, but she said, here it is, I'll write the prescription, go deal with it. 
But how about, and I don't want you to trash talk your doctors, but you've been around so many, I'm sure, some of the best physicians in the city with the best physicians. I, what is it like, especially someone like you, that I'm sure they're excited to be around you, when you bring that conversation up? I have no problem bringing that conversation up. I certainly understand, and we all have to understand, these people train for a long time in the subject area that they're practicing, and they are territorial. They don't want to give up uh, writing prescriptions for oxycodone. They just want you to take it and don't abuse it. But that's this is what they do. This is their area. I, not, I totally get that. But when you get the opportunity to say, look, we're on the edge now, the cutting edge of, of really being able to do some good for a lot of people. I, you can talk to them. I really think you can talk to them. They may not go along with it, but there are people out there that can find in, in the world of primary care physicians that will write this stuff. And, you know, just be easy about it. They don't know what, she didn't know what she was writing. She didn't know what kind of strength she was asking for. She just said, for pain, be compassionate, and whatever. So you got to let somebody who knows what they're doing. That's, that's it. I, no problem having that conversation with anybody. As a matter of fact, they probably would enjoy it because probably they're all afraid to talk about it. Well, who here is in a similar boat? People around the room? All right, so why don't, we, uh, why don't we thank Bob again, and let's get some people up here and get some ideas for how do we get people out. All right, so as promised, in just a second, we're going to bring some people up, and uh, we're going to get this going. So I uh, hope everybody's having a good time so far. I want to thank Bob again. That was just absolutely tremendous. All right, so right here, first and foremost, oh, we're going to need one more chair, Dan, please. Uh, so right here uh, to my left, we have Dr. Keith Saunders, and I never forget the doctor, uh, and with many stripes to his name. Uh, uh, North Northeastern uh, Institute of Cannabis, where I also teach, uh, and also a, a normal board member for how many years? Uh, five years now. I'm going to have them both introduce themselves. And Scott Churchill from uh, FCR Labs. Can we get a round of applause for these two, please? And they're both uh, they're both kind of all around guys. Scott really on the nuts and bolts of this industry, and uh, I'm really excited to have them here. And as promised, we're going to try to get some answers. You know, we uh, personally, as somebody who edits the Blunt Truth column, Mike Cann's Blunt Truth column for Dick Boston, uh, I try not to make it too insidery. You know, I don't want it to always be only if you've been involved with this for your whole life uh, will you understand this. So, um, why don't we just start with Scott and Keith? Can you give a quick introduction of yourselves so that the people here, not just in this right now, in talking about patients and caregivers, but after, you know, they know what they can approach you about. What are your, you know, your real areas of expertise? Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Everyone hear me okay? All right. So uh, my area of expertise is cannabis science. I work in a laboratory. We perform testing on the cannabis for the quality and the safety and the potency and the various compounds that are in it. And I also teach at the NIC, uh, Northeastern Institute of Cannabis, uh, safety and science. So I would, I would say that my experience is, is mainly in the, the technical aspects of cannabis and the science behind it. Uh, I am a uh, sociologist by training. Um, I got my PhD in sociology at Northeastern University for studying the marijuana policy reform movement, and I'm past president of Massachusetts Cannabis Reform Coalition. And just this past fall, um, helped open up the Northeastern Institute of Cannabis, which is the first vocational uh, cannabis training institute in the Northeast. Um, my area of expertise is really policy, and um, that's what I, I looked at drug policy and social movements, namely how we got from a point where cannabis was prohibited in 2000 when I was doing my research to where we are now, which I had to walk sideways down the aisle because this place is so full. I, this is really remarkable stuff, and it's really a social movement that has taken, you know, taken hold and really moved forward. Um, 
So my area of expertise is the policy. I can tell you about um, how Massachusetts law works, uh, what we need to do to fix it. Because there's a lot to be done. Uh, we do have legalization. People are sort of, you know, jumping forward to 2016, imagining that's going to happen. But we still have to fix our decrim law. Uh, we have people who have been arrested in years past who still have that on their records. We have people who have been convicted uh, who don't deserve criminal records for something that's no longer a crime. And uh, so that's something we also have to fix the medical law. So uh, before we get ahead of ourselves and start thinking about legal marijuana, we really need to look at what we have right now. That's excellent. All right, so we know where we are, who we got. We got the people who know what's up or up here. Uh, the next the next session, we're going to go with this one until 1.45, take a quick break, and at 2 o'clock we're going to get into the politics and, ha and and look at the future. For now, I really want to focus on um, on how people in Bob's situation, in others, in, in, in that, that exact situation, regardless of age or ailment, how they can, in this climate, navigate what we have. So not, we're not, you know, we're going to get into how we can make, change the, the world we live in a little bit. But for now, I mean, I got to say, I edit, like I said, I edit a column and I'm still perplexed about what the hell to do. So why don't we start, I'm going to start with a, a hands-on question and I would like you to both answer. Um, my grandmother is like, uh, I think she's 88 and she's got a, a number of issues and we've, uh, she's open to trying cannabis. Um, but you know, I can't, I don't have a million access to a bunch of strains, different ways for her to consume. We tried one thing and she didn't like it. And now I'm back to square one. You know, you can answer this question directly about this issue, but I'm sure this is a very common one. Where do I go from here when I still don't have a dispensary to look to? There's a couple websites. What am I doing here in Massachusetts? Well, step one is uh, your grandmother needs to go to a physician to write her a recommendation. And that will cost about $200, uh, assuming that she qualifies, and she probably will. Uh, that'll be another $50 that has to be paid to the Department of Public Health. That will get her registered as a patient. She is then, at that point, able to designate a caregiver, which is somebody, anybody that she wishes, who can re them themselves register with Massachusetts, pay $100 as a cultivating caregiver, and then begin to cultivate cannabis. However, if you are growing as a patient or a caregiver in Massachusetts, you have to tell the Department of Public Health where you are growing. And they are allowed to inspect that site, wherever it happens to be. So one of the pieces of advice I give to people is if you're going to do this, cultivate in a garage or a detached shed from the house that has some heat in it, because um, if you do it in your house, they can walk into your house. So literally, you're giving them permission to enter. Um, but as far as, as dispensaries, the first seeds went in soil last week. Um, in, one, in one dispensary in, in Ames, in, is it Amesbury? Or, um, I think, well, yeah, let's yeah, do a round of applause or what, everybody? We, yes, there, there, are, there are now seeds in soil, and at this point in time, they might be sprouts. Uh, there will be shortages. Massachusetts policy is such that it's designed for a shortage model, not a surplus model. Um, Basically, the Department of Public Health was given a grand opportunity, and they treated it like a bird, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to touch. They really failed on this, and we need yeah we need to fix that. So I'm going to follow up. So let, let's let's stick let's stick the caregiving system for a minute. Uh, so let's say we're following uh, what Keith said. So I'm going to follow up with Scott and say, okay, with what I have access to at my disposal, how do we start experimenting, seeing what might work, researching? I mean. You're the guy who knows that stuff, right? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, and it's an important question. Um, right now, the way that we're set up, your, your mother, you said? Grandmother. Grandmother should take full advantage of the patient relationship with her physician, uh, recommending physician. She should also make herself knowledgeable uh, through all the resources available. And when it comes down to using the medicine in a way that's most effective, journaling is going to be extremely important until the body of knowledge catches up to where we need to be. Are there any uh, uh, particular resources for journaling, good websites or anything like that, or, or tips that you have for people? Because um, well, this is critical, and yes. with, with cooking too. Yeah, um, well, in terms of uh, preparation of the can, well, it, it, there's the entire grow process, which is extremely detailed. Um, to Grow cannabis into effective medicine um, can be done. It's, it takes a bit of a challenge. 
Um, the people who have some experience in this, unfortunately, um, the more experience you have in, the, in your background, the, the less qualified the state con considers you to be. Uh, we sort of, we, we, we created a medical marijuana policy failing to realize that we already had medical marijuana, suffice to say. There were already people using it medicinally and so forth. As far as procuring it legally, you can cultivate your own or you will be at some point in the next few months able to go to a dispensary or to a registered marijuana dispensary uh, in Massachusetts. But right now we are at a, a period of, of great shortage and um, we do need people to grow it. I mean, it's without a doubt. That's, that is the way that patients are going to get the supply that they need as, as soon as they can. Um, as far as growing your own, at least you have the benefit of knowing what's in it. You know, you know whether you're using fertilizers, you know whether that you're using pesticides. I wouldn't advise using either. Uh, you can use a fertilizer, an organic fertilizer, um, but avoid the chemical pesticides and, uh, and metals and, and so forth. Uh, Scott knows from, from testing. MCR Labs has been testing now for, for months uh, and has a, has a body of what is available for medical cannabis in Massachusetts. And so uh, the variety, you know, the quality varies. I mean, he, can, he can attest to that a lot better than I can. Uh, but as far as people growing it for themselves, that's probably the best way to assure your quality. That's right. Uh, we also post our results for people to test so that if you have a question about whether or not something has been tested and what's in it, it's available for you to see. So it's a way to confirm. But I just wanted to also add, too, in terms of journaling, it's, um, it's also very important for getting familiar with how the medicine will impact you whether it's effective, not effective, how much you should consume, and what what might be the side effects. So you need to become familiar with the different types of medicine, how well it works, when you should use it, uh, how often you should use it, etc. That's where journaling, keeping track of what works and what doesn't, and that sort of thing will be very helpful to the patient. And what are you actually testing for? What are some of the parameters that people should get used to hearing? Uh, you know, I was just on the West Coast, and you know, I walk into a store in Vancouver, Washington, and they have they have a percentages, right? Uh, so everywhere it's different. It's unbelievably confusing, even for a long time uh, uh, a cannabis user and an editor like me. Where do I even start? What are you testing for? What are some of the terms that people are going to expect to hear besides THC, uh, including THC, you know, whatever? Well, the most common thing that people are aware of are the cannabinoids. THC, CBD, etc. There are actually over 85 different kinds of cannabinoids. The most popular ones are being THC and CBD. Um, if you look at the report, you'll see, depending on the laboratory that does the testing, we will be showing six to ten different cannabinoids, depending on the report that we get. And those cannabinoids can give you an indication of based on that medicine, those cannabinoids, and what their concentrations and ratios are, how it's going to affect you. And once you become familiar with those effects, you'll be able to target medicine that meets the profile that works for you best. We also do safety testing. We're testing for mold, mildew, pesticide, any, any kind of contaminant that might hurt you, uh, heavy metals, uh, pesticides, plant growth regulators things that are going to negatively impact the, uh, or could potentially harm your health if you consume it. Now what happens if you, I'm like asking, like I'm just so curious now, what happens if you test something and it does have some of these harmful uh, qualities? Do you go, you go back to dispensaries or caregivers and tell them and they say... Right, so we've had a couple of people come to test with us and they've had medicine that was not suitable for consumption and what they ended up doing was burying it in their backyard. Now, when it comes to the dispensaries, um, it's gonna be a similar thing. If you have uh, medicine that's gonna make you sick, we're gonna report it, and that material has to be destroyed. We can't do anything about it at that point. If, there's, if it's contaminated with pesticides, heavy metals, or microbiological contamination, it's not suitable for human use, and it needs to be uh, disposed of properly and safely. Do you have anything on that, or? Uh, well, I mean, along these lines, is we're dealing with a couple of things. Um, it's an organic product, and so the potency of what you're going to get uh, from the organic material is going to vary by where it grows on the plant. So that, that which grows in the center coal is going to have a greater potency than that which grows down on the lower branches. 
Um, so getting a consistent profile from a pharmaceutical medicinal perspective is not going to be possible until we extract and concentrate uh, effectively and can get it to basically 99% purity in terms of the in terms of the cannabinols and the terpenes. Very close. Very close to the clip. Um, so, Keith, uh, you and I were t uh, talking the other day about how uh, strains are so far from their original strains that, you know, a jack hair here is completely different from a jack hair there, this and that. How, and this question is obviously for both of you, how cautious should we be moving forward with names and such? And also, um, well, I mean, really, that's, and, and also, uh, should, when dispensaries do come on, online and when, when there are more consistency in caregivers, should people be looking to have this, you know, m maintain consistency, use the same place and such? Well, uh, this goes into the, the how we name cannabis, nomenclature, and, and a lot of it is marketing. A lot of what people, whatever the trendy name is for that season or that year becomes everything all of a sudden is Pineapple Express. Because that's what people want to buy. Um, realistically, until we get down to the genetics, we're not going to know for sure. And, and can, the cannabis plant is one of the, the most genetically engineered plants that we've ever encountered. I mean, we have done all sorts of stuff to this. The idea that there being pure land races is kind of odd because we've been cultivating this for 5,000 years. So chances are whatever's growing wild has already had some human intervention to it. Um, cannabis used to be called after it was called cannabis and hemp. It was called marijuana, it was called muggles, mez, smoke, tea, gauge. Then we get into the 1960s and we see a popularization of the marketplace. And now we start to see marketers. And now we have Maui Waui and Acapulco Gold and Thai Stick, Panama Red, and naming the geographic areas from which these things came. Then we move into the 1980s and 90s, really into the 90s, and the winner of the first High Times Cannabis Cup 25 or 26 years ago was named Williams Wonder. And then there's Northern Lights number no. 5 and Skunk number no. 1, and names that have no geographic designation. Well, the reason being, everybody moved their production indoors where you control temperature, humidity, everything. And once you can do that, Amsterdam becomes New York City, becomes Los Angeles. Okay, every, every indoor location is more or less the same, so we stop naming by geography. But what we get into is we get a whole bunch of people that are doing crossbreeding, back crossing, etc., and just pulling names out of the air, making up names. If, if you go through High Times or Stunt Magazine, you just see year after year a whole new string of names. What matters is the cannabinol and terpene profile. That's what matters. If everything else is just, it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's conceit. <laughs> What is your cannabinoid and terpene profile? Along what Keith is saying, um, as a scientist testing the, the cannabis products in the industry, the name doesn't mean anything at all to me. Absolutely nothing. There's as much difference between something with the same name as there is with completely different names. And part of it is because of inaccurately uh, labeled product, whether someone got seeds that were that they said had a certain name, or it could be that the seeds that were produced by something have different uh, plants that grow from them, or it could be how the plant was grown, the conditions it was grown at. So for me, the name means nothing. Uh, unfortunately, under Massachusetts law, dispensaries will not be allowed to proprietarily name their strains. That is, they can, they can say it's strawberry cough, but they can't say it's our dispensary strawberry cough. So what's sold in Salem in a dispensary and what's sold in Plymouth under the name strawberry cough could be completely different strains. If they could proprietary if they could proprietarily name their strains, they could say this is our brand of this and have some greater consistency and say this is, you know, whatever it is, ATC's uh, strawberry cough and then somebody else has their brand of strawberry cough, they will maintain their genetic lineage as closely as they can, or they'll modify as they can within their own supply. Here's something else that's happening in Massachusetts. Everything is vertically integrated. The only thing, the only time that the cannabis goes from the grower, packager, processor, distributor model is to go out to the testing lab. And so they send a small amount out to the testing lab. The testing lab does the profile test and says, okay, this batch is this. And now you process package and so forth off of that batch. 
Uh, but realistically, uh, for patients concerned, what you want is to know what your cannabinoid profile is, uh, more than anything else, and your terpenes. Uh, we're finding out the terpene cannabinoids really have an entourage effect. It's, it's kind of like some wine sort of affects you differently, even though the alcohol is the same. Uh, some wines are a little bit more heady, and some wines are a little more hazy. Uh, same thing with cannabis. Well, let's let's give the here's the. We don't have four hours to talk about edibles, which is what it would take. But I want to throw it on the table, not just edibles, but I'm sure there are people in this room who aren't interested in smoking. Smoking have never been interested in smoking. Uh, we could you could talk about rigs, but I'm sure there are people who don't feel like carrying a blowtorch around everywhere they go. Um, I'm really interested in what kind of testing do you have you done with edibles or anything of this sort or with activated marijuana or just what kind of tips do you have for the people that are out there? This is the real Wild West. I was just in the Wild West where they sell five dose cookies. Anybody here ever eaten a cookie in five different sittings? So it's it's very confusing. Help 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 the audience here. This is this is this is the first cannabis convention in New England. Help everybody get moving. All right. It's very important when you're when you're talking about edibles that you consider the safety aspect of it. It's going to be very different than smoked cannabis. And if you're not familiar with it, it's going to be considerably different from your previous experiences with it. So what I always tell people is become familiar with the type of medicine you're consuming in a safe and responsible way. Until you become familiar with it, um, it wouldn't be uh, responsible to just be consuming it without knowing how much to consume and how it's going to affect you and for how long. It, uh, consumed cannabis comes into you, uh, the effect comes on, it takes longer to come on, and it takes longer to go away that, as compared with smoked cannabis. And the, the main reason that, you know, what you were asking about as far as activated cannabis, so a lot of people don't know that if you do not uh, heat the cannabis product, the uh, THCA, uh, sufficiently, it doesn't become activated into the THC form. When you smoke it, obviously the combustion causes it to convert to the activated form. But when you, you when you create an edible, you either need to use activated form that's already been heated, or it needs to be heated sufficiently in your cooking or preparing process. Excellent. All right. Well, so I have 20 minutes left, and I'm glad I didn't forget this. We're gonna. Are you guys cool with opening the floor? Yeah. I think that's this is for you, not for me. So, uh, do we have a, a cordless mic? Um, you know, we'll have probably time for a few questions. Uh, let's raise their hand first. You. Uh, can you? Hey. Can mic? We're all friends. I'm sorry, you said uh, using colloidal silver? To reproduce seeds. To reproduce seeds. And what's your take on that? And the other question was about uh, dispensaries selling seeds. Dispensaries cannot sell seeds. If you are a registered cultivator or a registered patient who's being cultivated for in Massachusetts, you are not allowed to purchase from registered marijuana dispensaries. So where do people get seeds? It's like the magic ounce that falls into my hand. It costs a hundred dollars. Where do the dispensaries get seeds? That's the question I have. By law, they have to grow everything from seed. I don't know. I mean, the, the Department of Public Health is treating this stuff like it's plutonium. You have to have a registry. Everything has to be on camera at all times, and you have to have people's backgrounds checked and all that other stuff for a plant that's absolutely non-toxic and nobody's ever died from. Um, where the seeds come from, nobody knows. This is this is the imaginary land we live in. And dispensaries cannot sell seeds, and you can't buy them. And if you want, there's a gentleman by the name of Mark Emery who made himself a decent fortune and spent five years in prison for making it available for people to buy seeds. They're advertised in magazines. There's a bunch of them. That's all I can say. Just to add to that, and also, any tips? You know, she'd ask for one in particular, but are there any tips, growing tips in particular? Right. I'm not familiar with using colloidal silver for um, any kind of part of the manufacturing process of seeds. Limited understanding. I know the seeds come from the plant. Um, 
I do also know that cannabis is a bioaccumulator of metals, so my bias would be against exposing it to metals unnecessarily. Okay, I've heard of colloidal silver being used under the care of a physician, physician under uh, for medical purposes, but I wouldn't recommend uh, the average person out there doing anything with any metals around uh, the cannabis plant. Very good. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that if you're able to actually uh, cultivate yourself, excuse me, if you're able to cultivate for yourself. I've heard that they're going to stop allowing patients to cultivate yes. their own for themselves, and now you're making me aware that if they are, they need to register with the Department of Public Health. Yes, what, the way that it works is this. Uh, they're, they're, they're extremely afraid that marijuana might get into the hands of the general public, and so they set up a situation where when dispensaries open nearby, now they haven't defined what this is, in other states it's 25 miles. Um, when, when a dispensary opens nearby a patient, that patient's opportunity to cultivate no longer exists unless they qualify under financial hardship, physical disability, inability to, to travel to and from, and inability to get a caregiver to deliver their medicine to them. So you more or less have to be poor, blind, no access to the tea, or just the tea's not running. Um, and, no problem. And other, yeah, but literally, this is one of the difficulties because if you're going to cultivate, you have to tell DPH you're cultivating. When they open up a dispensary nearby your house, they're going to tell you to stop cultivating. They know where you're cultivating, and they can come in and make sure that you've broken everything down. This brings me. This brings me to a question I wanted to ask, and we'll, we'll get a couple more crowd ones in there. But I think this is an important one. Besides coming to the New England Cannabis Convention. Uh, you know, they're changing the laws on us constantly. They're changing the paperwork that's necessary. How do people keep up? Well, if you're if you're being prudent about things, is it the DPH website? What well, give give a give a, a prescription to people for what they need to uh, stay educated? The, the Department of Public Health website is their official means of communication. So as long as you're consistent with that, however, they don't update their website necessarily in time. Uh, they didn't announce for three and a half or four weeks that they had increased, the, they would require patients to pay 50 bucks to register. It took them almost a month to put that up on their website. Uh, it's, it's really, it's a horrible mess. It really is. And I, I, mean, I feel for people who need this uh, because DPH has really dropped the ball. Scott, yeah, I would like to say along that lines is it's, it's very hard for me because uh, I do this every day. I, I teach at the school at nights. I work at the lab every day. It's just automatic. I keep up to date and abreast of the information, the changes that are taking place. But it is a big challenge trying to stay on top of this because the DPH has a website that is lagging and lacking. And it really is hard to find the, the information that you need. Being involved in community, cannabis community related organizations, uh, websites, forums, etc. Anything to do with the industry uh, puts you into contact with a lot of people. And the more people that you're in contact with, the more information that will come your way in a timely fashion. Stay on top of the DPH website, but don't rely on it solely for the information that, that you use. All right, all right, here we go. Uh, what's your name? Joe. Yes, sir. Um, so not a lot of people uh, applauded when people were asked if they related with Pablo Bill's situation. I cannot personally relate, but my grandmother in the 70s smoked marijuana in the Waltham Hospital before it closed because she had stomach cancer and my father, who smoked pot, would go there, make sure that nurses were on a 15-minute cycle and they would come back. My grandmother was able to survive eating uh, in the last days of her, her young life at 51 when she died of stomach cancer. She was a victim of the uh, Mother's Little Helper, if you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so, my question is, there is, uh, I'm a taxi driver, I've talked to a lot of people for the last 20 years in Boston. There's a growing sentimentality on the West Coast that 
people are, people like me who smoke pot, are getting cards simply so they can get a card. Oh, my back hurts. In my grandmother's, in my grandmother's situation.